You know, we've been talking about women and corporations and board seats, and I was one of those women. I was at Intel for many years. But what if you find out that you really don't care about it? <laughs> and it occurred to me, if women are not here, where are they? And I wanted to become one of those women who wanted to find out. Actually, I think if they're not in the boardrooms and CEOs, they must be somewhere really smart, because women are smart. So just find where they are and go be there. So I went on a search within myself. So since we are in the Valley, since I'm from Intel, this is a world of TLAs, which is three-letter acronyms. So I thought I'll make my talk about a spa, you know, our personal spa. So the place I go to when I want to get my own massage of myself, my emotions. So when I was younger, when I was in the, uh, uh, in the swing of things, to me, the spa meant it's S is for success, P is for perfection, and A is for ambition. You know, I wanted to be. I was one of those people who, you know, I got into a college fight. You know, the 5,000 people write the test and 10 people get into it. 50,000 people write the test and 20 people get into whatever it is. You know, I got into all of them. I studied math. I did two MBAs. I came here. I joined Intel. I was pretty good, but after 10 years. I think to find out what you want to be, you should look at what you're being. And when I looked at the last 10 years or 12 years of my career at Intel, I realized the choices I made in my career were always about to do something new. I always gave up being a manager to be able to do something new. I always gave up getting a little bit more money to be able to go do something new. And I never applied for a job. I always invented my own job. I would find somebody who's doing really great and say, hey, I want to do this with you. For that, I need to take less salary, no problem. Uh, I need to travel more, yeah, you know. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know. I owe, and I thought, if this is what I am being, and but in my mind, you know, I always say, um, what's that movie with the, Meryl Streep, where she's like this very tough boss uh, in Vogue, kind of a uh, devil wears Prada. I always wanted to be like that. You know, like this woman who just walks in, nattily dressed, and everybody like just shakes in their boots when they see me. And then here I am where I go, everybody's like, oh, hi, Lakshmi, everybody hugs me. And I'm like this one <laughs> big teddy bear, you know. I'm like, what the heck is this? You know, I mean, I just want to be like this tough woman. So. I think sometimes, epif and I, I do everything late. I got married in my 30s, had kids in my 40s, started something on my, I mean, got my epiphany in my 40s. I mean, I'm always like a decade late than everybody else in everything. You know, so my friends are getting their kids married, and I'm like, oh, my son is in fourth grade, you know. <laughs> I got to worry about where he's going to go to high school and, you know, stuff like that. So I found that. You know, this whole spa that I'm looking for has a completely different meaning for me. And my journey in my 40s has been for me to find out what is my spa? What is it that I stand for? And the first thing for me was that uh, from success, you know, what the heck does success mean? Is it the amount of money you have in the bank? Is it, you know, how many letters are there, you know, MBA, PFA, DBA, PhD, blah, blah, after your name? Or what the heck is this success? I realized I was running after this success that's defined by somebody else, not by me. So I said, what is my sense of success? To me, my sense of success is somebody who has a sense of humor about every goddamn thing in their life. <laughs> you should be able to laugh about your success and your failures, and you should be laugh about everything. So I, you know, I, I, I thought of, you know, I was in India, and everybody used to tell me that, oh, you know, if you were only a little lighter skinned, you could have been good looking, you know. <laughs> if only you were, a, I mean, and my uncle would say, thank God you're short, because if you're tall, how difficult it is to find a man taller than you. So I was like, wow, you know, this is... Uh, so I came to America, Portland, Oregon, 92% white population. I thought I've died and gone to heaven because everybody wanted a tan. And here I was with a permanent tan. You know, so I was like, wow. And everybody wanted to date me. I'm like, cool, blonde, blue-eyed, that was my, the guy I wanted to date. It's like... And um, 
And then I, I was like, this is fantastic. And Lakshmi, name like Lakshmi, right? So I said, remember it like likes me before they come up with something like lox and salmon or something like that. You got to come up with your own way to remember your name, which is like pretty cool. And so I realized that, you know, and my dad taught me a lot about this sense of humor business. And um, the second thing I thought about is that it's not perfection. What the heck is perfection? You know, and I was talking to my dad and I had my list of things I wanted in a guy when I wanted to get married. I said, it's really tall and fantastic, you know, look like a model, be a billionaire, read poetry for me when I want, but also, okay, <laughs> uh, if I want to go off to work and then, you know, there's that, and some 30 things I had. So my dad looked at me and said, honey, I'm so glad you know exactly what you want. But if you have all these things that you want in a guy, don't you think the guy wants the same in you? So I thought about it and said, oh, well, I guess I am not a model myself. I guess I am not a billionaire myself. So it occurred to me that, oh, OK, maybe I should like cut off a few things on the list and <laughs> settle for something real. And, um, and the other thing I also learned, it's all a matter of perspective. You know, it's truly about having a great perspective along with sense of humor. So I'll tell you a little story of we were talking about microfinance. You know, I took a group of my friends from America to India because I wanted to show them India the way I want them to see India, not the goddamn, you know, like some, you know, snakes and snake charmers and stuff, but real people, you know. <laughs> so I took them to, you know, we went to Hyderabad, which is where I'm from, and then I took them to a village, and there's this women who are getting a loan. So I wanted them to see how they decide on getting a loan and what they do afterwards. So we saw all the women, and then we went to all their businesses to see them. And uh, so one of the women in whose shop we went to, she had a wood cutting business. And she's the one who gets the money. You know, you have to be the woman owner of the business to get the money. So she got the money. So we went there, and she was like sitting on the corner. Her husband was calling all the shots. He was doing everything. And he was the guy cutting the wood, selling it. And he was the manager there. And I was like, you know what? This woman is like a doormat. And she got the money. She's giving it to her husband. He's running the show. So I was kind of a bit upset. So I went to her and I said, you know, I have a question for you. You are the one who got the money, but why is he running the show? And she looks at me and says, Madam, he works for me. <laughs> she says, why should I carry all that wood? Let him do it. If he's not nice to me, he doesn't get the money. He works for me. And I thought, boy, that's a perspective. <laughs> so from then on, I walk into the room. I think I look like everybody else. It doesn't occur to me I'm short, I'm fat, I'm brown, I'm a woman. It, nothing occurs to me. If they're all men, I think I'm that. If they're all white, I think I'm that. If they're all brown, I think I'm that. So, and it's amazing, you know, whatever you look at, you become that. Who, I mean, you don't look at yourself, right? You know, you look at, you're looking at everybody else, you can say, oh, I think that I'm that too. So I can walk into a big models meet and feel completely comfortable because I think I look like that, you know? <laughs> So, who knows? And um, the last thing I want to talk about is the A. And it's from ambition. I have come to say that A is about allowing myself to be. I think for so long I have been what I think I ought to be that I forgot to allow myself to be. And the best lesson to this also came from my dad. And then one day I was coming back from college. I got into a big fight with some guy on the road. And in India, it's like a, it, it's a village. You know, it's a billion people village. You come home, by the time you come home, your dad knows what happened. <laughs> so my dad says, oh, honey, I heard your principal called me. You got into some fight with some guy on the street. I said, I don't understand this, you know. I go to call him, and this guy is an idiot. He's like, you know, calling somebody something, and cat and calling. And so I got mad at him. I fought with him. I think my teacher should have appreciated me, how strong I was for everybody else. They're telling me, like, why can't you put your head down and walk? Why do you want to fight with everybody? You know, I'm just not popular in my school anymore because I'm fighting with all these guys. They should appreciate me for that. <laughs> so my dad said, there's a decision you need to make. And this, I think, has been my life's um, path for me, personally, since then. Is that he said, you have a choice. You either want to be a good girl, that means do what they ask you to do. 
wear nice clothes, sit on the scooter with your, like this, not with two legs on either side of the scooter. <laughs> And, uh, you know, don't fight with everybody. Put your head down and walk, you know. Do everything that, the, that they are asking you to do and they will call you a good girl. Or do what you want to do and people won't like it. But the people who like you will be there for you for the rest of your life. You have a choice. You want to be a good girl or do you want to do what you want to do? You can be both. You can do whatever the heck you want to do. Speak up, fight, and say, why doesn't the world love me? I want to be this good girl. Doesn't happen. And I think from then on I understood, where do I want to be a good girl? There are some times I just shut up and let the crap go on because I just don't want to fight. And there are times I stand up and say, I'm not going to keep quiet. So you, I have learned to choose my battles and say, when do I want to be a good girl and when do I want to be this fighting person. And so, so when I started, when I went to uh, TED to India, people would say, where is TED? Why didn't he come to meet me? Why did he send you this little brown woman? And especially in India, white guys are big, you know? So they're like, why didn't they come? So I would be like, well, you know, this God you gotta deal with, so let me tell you what TED is all about. And, you know, but once I did it, I realized that we in India, and generally we in Asia, are lousy at marketing ourselves. We have become the stereotype to the world, and we let it happen because we are not telling our stories ourselves. So I just said, I want to move back to India. I want to start something called INC, which stands for Innovation and Knowledge, and we want to tell stories. We want to tell stories of these stereotypes of people with accents, of people who don't sound, who come from small villages, who come from, you know, there's a guy on our platform who talks about, he's, a, you know, he wanted to invent a sanitary napkin that's cheap for women in the village. So he didn't know how to uh, test market sanitary napkins, so he wore it himself and then started pumping blood into it walking around. And <laughs> so we put his talk up saying, first man to wear sanitary napkins, 500,000 views, you know. <laughs> So, you know, there are amazing people doing amazing things. You have to give them the right platform, put the right headline, and make them successful. So that's what we are about. So I just want to say that, you know, we've, we have a quote that drives us. And what it is is that life ought not to be measured by the number of breaths you take, but by the number of moments that take your breath away. So what if we redefine success as not as billions of dollars, but by the billions of moments we accumulate? To us, impact is the billions of moments that we create for others. And impact is, as Gloria Steinem said, it's not just about raising our daughters like our sons, it's about raising our sons like our daughters. And I think when we know how to interact with the world, that's when we know how to be truly, truly billionaires and create success. So I want to end with uh, you know, a little poem that I wrote about, you know, we are all looking for that one thing, that one job, that one person, that one soulmate, that one thing. But to me, this is what it means to have a soulmate, whether it's in your job or in a person. They say, there is one person, one and only one person that's my soulmate. Somewhere in this world, hidden in some corner, awaiting my arrival. I say I already found him. Not once, not twice, but many times over, in tiny moments, on a long walk up the mountain, in a special move on the dance floor, in a moment of locked glances, in a casual conversation on a flight, holding hands along the waterfront, around the globe, in many shapes and forms. I say the one soulmate of my life has become multiple tiny particles and spread all over the world in some spaces and shapes, a few solid pieces, in other spaces, a tiny speck. Maybe this explains the happiness I feel, the contentment I create, the feeling of recognition I have in the collection of those moments that fill my life's quilt, keeping me warm, safe, and smiling. So it's here to all of you, my soulmates, let's all be billionaires of moments. Thank you.